Welcome, welcome everyone to Science Thursday with Brookhaven Lab. It's a pleasure having you today here today. Uh, the purpose of Science Thursdays is to engage our student and education community in STEM topics by meeting BNL STEM professionals and learn more about their work and career path that got them to where they are today. We hope that at the end of the 45 minutes, uh, that uh, the, the information that you have heard will spark your interest in a STEM career and perhaps even consider being part of the Brookhaven Lab community. Good afternoon, I'm Aleida Perez from the Office of Educational Programs here at Brookhaven Lab. And I'm joined by my colleague, Diana Murphy, who will manage the Q&A portion of today's discussion. Before I introduce our guest today, uh, just a few reminders. Uh, please submit your, quest your, to meet your questions using the Q&A section chat. It's right at the lower, right, uh, lower side of your, of your uh, Zoom app. We will try to get as many questions as we can possibly can today. And if you have any difficulties or issues with the video stream or audio, you can let IT know by making a comment on the chat section. Okay. So. Today, I am joined by Dr. Olga Mayor Bracero. She's an atmospheric scientist uh, who recently joined Brookhaven Lab, Brookhaven Lab Environmental and Climate Science Department and is the group leader for the aerosol related infrastructure group. Today, Olga will share her work on how atmospheric aerosols impact climate systems and will also tell us about her career path. Olga, bienvenido. Welcome. How are you? Thank you, Aleida. Good afternoon, everybody. I am doing very good. I'm happy to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Awesome. I know you joined BNL very recently, and I know that we will talk a little bit about your career path, but where were you before we came, you came to BNL? Yeah, so I joined the lab in August this year, and I come from Puerto Rico, where I used to work as a full professor at the University of Puerto Rico. So I'm happy to be change. here today to, to share with you, you know, some of the work that we've been doing over the last years. Awesome. It's a big, it's a, it's a very big, in, but good change. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to have your BNL. Okay. So one of the things that uh, when you and I were talking, um, I mentioned in the introduction that you are an atmospheric scientist. And for our students uh, and, and audience that we have today here, what is an atmospheric scientist? What is it that you are and you sure. do? Sure, so an atmospheric scientist is a, a person who study the physics and chemistry of, of the atmosphere. So specifically, we study, for example, clouds, gases, aerosols, which are airborne particles, and we'll be talking a little bit more about those. And, and atmospheric scientists work in topics such as atmospheric composition, air pollution, weather prediction, climate change, climate trends. My formation is in chemistry. So mm -hmm. my PhD was in chemistry, and during my postdoc, I work with atmospheric aerosols. So I've been applying my knowledge in chemistry in the study of atmospheric sciences, but focusing on aerosols and on clouds. Yeah, so this isn't, so how those, you know, for example, the particles that we emit, the chemistry of those have, a, have an effect in the way, uh, you know, clouds, just an example. Are, I could, are, if you... Yeah, no, mm -hmm. if, if I, I could share my screen now and I could show yeah. people if, if people, you know, if they don't know what aerosols are, you know, let me see if I can do that quickly here. Um, yeah, let's do this. So, so when we talk about atmospheric aerosols, we are talking about these very small particles that they can be in, in the form of solid or liquid, you know, and they are suspended in the air. And when we talk about the, uh, those that are in the atmosphere, they, they are in the air, but you can have aerosols in a can, you know, in, in different places, you mm -hmm. know, but when we talk about atmospheric aerosols, they are 
solid or liquid suspended in the air. And you can see that the sizes, they vary, you know, you can have very small particles from like few nanometers to really large particles that they can be in the tens of micrometers. And those that you see here are images that we took using a, a microscope of high resolution. And uh, you can see that they have different shapes, you know, different sources. Yes. And uh, when you compare them, like what we are doing here with a, a, a hair, you know, a human hair, you can see, for example, here a, a, a beach sand, you know, and here very, very small particles, like those that are very dangerous for, you know, public health, you know, and they are really, really small when you compare them with the, with the human hair. So, and those particles, you know, like people sometimes ask, so where do they come from? Do they come from the cans, you know, from, from aerosol sprays? Well, when yes. we talk about atmospheric aerosols, they come from different sources and some of those sources can be natural, like, like from the desert uh, in mm -hmm. the Sahara, for example, in Africa or, or from volcanoes, like eruptions, you know, like here, but they can also actually be anthropogenic, like from traffic, from cold combustion, from wildfires, you know. So, so yeah, they have different sources as well. So they have different different shape and different sources of them. So, knowing that they are different sources of this atmospheric particles, um, what is the impact of those atmospheric particles on the environment? You know, health, weather, climate. You know. Yeah. So I can uh, I can use these to explain a little bit mm -hmm. on that. You know, part. Particles, when, when they are in the atmosphere, they can affect visibility. You can see here, there's a Indian gate in Delhi, and you can say you, they, they over, you know, post together these two images, you know, these two photos on a day with a lot of pollution. And actually this was just after the lockdowns of COVID-19, you know, at the beginning of, of the yes. COVID pandemic. And you can see the difference, you know, how can they degrade the visibility and this degradation in visibility can affect aviation, agriculture, you know, can have different impacts. Of course, it can affect public health, you know, so uh, because of those very small particles, we can, we can actually breathe them and some of them can come mm -hmm. inside, you know, uh, our respiratory system. They can degrade right. structures. They can also uh, have input of nutrients that can a, affect marine and terrestrial ecosystem, they can have an impact on climate because they mm -hmm. can interact with the solar radiation as well as with the radiation, the, the thermal radiation infrared that the Earth is emitting back to space. They can affect that energy balance, you know, and that yeah. can produce cooling or warming of the mm -hmm. atmosphere. And they can also affect weather. For example, yeah. affecting the formation of clouds or affecting hurricane activity. So they have impacts. And uh, our group over the last years, it, we, 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 while I was working in Puerto Rico, we focus on, on these three areas, climate, weather, and also air quality, which has to yes. do with public health and, and visibility. Yeah, because uh, you know the health quality, the, the the air quality in terms of the health, right? We we hear about asthma and other respiratory illnesses that tend to be associated with the increase of these particles, right? This increase atmospheric particles in certain regions, and more, you know, affected. Some groups are more affected than others, and usually, you know, nations that are uh, that are not as 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 wealthy tend to take the brunt of that. Of that, of that as well. I remember when I was growing in Puerto Rico, <laughs> the Sahara uh, dust, you know, and every June you, you will see that coming uh, on the island. Um, so I, I know that, you know, you talk about the environmental impact and, and, and the health impact of this atmospheric aerosols has on, 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 on the planet Earth and us as humans, you know. So what aspects of that, you just said to me, why should we care? Why people should spend you know, pay attention to, to, to this science? Well, precisely because of that, you know, uh, the, the impacts that mm -hmm. 
in, in the case of the science that, that, that we were doing in Puerto Rico and also we are doing right now here, uh, they, uh, these particles, they, they can have an impact in the, on the environment. And mm -hmm. we should care about our environment that can produce not only damage to ourselves, but also to nature, to animals, to structures, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, to things that affect us, such as climate and weather, for example. So mm -hmm. we really need to, to care about these. And, and uh, yeah, you will see what we've been doing uh, over the years. Uh, so now that you mentioned that, you know, that in Puerto Rico, and that's where you were before you joined us here at BNL, um, you, you were, you, as I was reading and we were talking, you were the director of the atmospheric chemistry and aerosol lab. So can you tell us a little bit about the mission of the research mission of your, of your, of your lab back in Puerto Rico? Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, let me show you here uh, the, the group that I had at the University of Puerto Rico, who I was leading, I was working in the Department of Environmental Science, and uh, we were, lead, I was leading the Atmospheric Chemistry and Aerosols Research Group. And uh, the main purpose of this group was to gain a better understanding of the variability of atmospheric aerosols, so temporal and spatial variability, also of aerosol and cloud interactions. How can aerosols impact cloud formation, for example? Mm -hmm. Also the composition of these aerosols and the sources, where were they coming from? We, for example, we studied a lot, we were talking about African dust and mineral dust. We studied, put a lot of effort uh, and a lot of time, you know, on trying to understand better the impact of those in the Caribbean region. And uh, also we study biomass burning aerosols, sea salt aerosols, anthropogenic aerosols, and the impact of those on air quality, weather and climate. And most of the work that we've been doing uh, was in tropical regions. And in the last years, uh, we were focusing in the Caribbean. Yeah, that's such a very, very. And I think we will talk a little bit later about the impact of that. but. So you focus, you it was a not just in Puerto Rico, right? You, it, it has a broader impact to the Caribbean region as well, and mm -hmm. so so yeah. it, it had that, that had that level of, of impact as well. Um, when you you and I were, were talking about, you, you also mentioned that you were the direct you were uh, the director of two atmospheric observatories. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the about you know about that work and the and the findings that you 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 had. Sure, sure. Actually, those images that you see here, they are from some of the observatories. But before I get to the observatories, let me mm -hmm. let me tell you something else as part of of because this is going to lead us uh, to why we had those observatories where we had them. You know, so mm -hmm. so as part of my work in Puerto Rico, we were a, we had several projects in the tropics, and this map here shows you the, the locations of those projects. In the last year, we focused more on the greater Caribbean region, and and it was not only because this is where I was living, but it was also because that region. Actually, it's when we talk about about the Caribbean, we're not talking right now only about the Caribbean islands, but the greater Caribbean basin. Mm -hmm. And this is any country with coastline on the Caribbean basin. So we're talking about more than 44 million people. And the processes that we study there, they can be applied to other regions in the world. But also, also, and that region that we have interest in, it's in the lie, it lies in the path of tropical storms and hurricanes, because you know that uh, tropical storms and hurricanes, they form in, in, in this area here. It, mm -hmm. This region as well is impacted by African dust, as we mentioned before, but also we have here the Soufrier Hills a volcano in the island of Montserrat. And also we get sometimes the impact of that. And sometimes as you can see by these trajectories uh, of air, air mass trajectories that, that is these lines that you see here, sometimes even we get uh, air masses from North America and those also bring some pollution to the island. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, this is an area that is understudied and is highly vulnerable to the air's changing climate. So 
those are some of the reasons why we decided that an aerosol monitoring program was going to be important in the region. And that's why uh, we decided to have some stations in, in Puerto Rico. And we, call, we, we put one of them here in the northeastern tip of the island. And the other one, the other main station was here. We, we also had other places where we'll be, we've been doing measurements. But these two are very important that they were, the location was strategically chosen because the prevailing wind direction that we have is northeast, you know. So here we were getting, a, this station is called Cape San Juan. We're getting very clean air masses that only has the influence of the ocean or sometimes even Saharan does. And then this station is in a cloud forest. So it's high and there are clouds all the time, but then we can see the interaction of these aerosols that they have passed this station with the clouds that we have here. So uh, the two stations are, you know, in, in an excellent uh, location for aerosol and cloud studies. And uh, these are the stations, you know, this is the one in the coastal site and uh, we're part of, uh, we're in a nature reserve. It's a beautiful place where there is a lighthouse and we are part of the NOAA uh, aerosol network and also part of NASA, NASA's mm -hmm. Ironet and, uh, and NASA's Pandora and NASA's MPLNet. So these are all uh, networks that NASA has to study aerosols. And also we are part of the World Meteorological Organization. They have a program that is called Global Atmosphere Watch and our station is also part of, of these. And we've been running 24 seven since 2004, except for the impact of Maria that I, I will mm -hmm. tell you. So, and this is the other station. It is also a beautiful place. It's located yes, in it a is. national forest. You know that place. It's I know that place. It's in El Junque. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called the name of this rainforest, and uh, it's a cloud forest, as I said before, and it's an ideal place to 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 study, you know, uh, aerosol and cloud interactions. And it's a mountain, it's a tropical mountain cloud forest, so it's one of the most sensitive and vulnerable of the world's ecosystem to climate change. So it's also very important to understand what's happening in this in these places, in particular with, for example, a uh, what has to do with cloud and the impact of aerosols on cloud because that could impact the hydrological cycle. So, but I don't know, I, I, I think that maybe maybe some of you know that, that uh, yeah. we were in 2017, uh, we had the impact of Hurricane Maria uh, in Puerto Rico. And uh, it was a very strong hurricane and it was almost category five when it hit Puerto Rico and it ripped across the entire island. Uh, the winds, as you see there, they were over 150 miles per hour. And it, it has been the most powerful hurricane to mm -hmm. hit the island in almost 90 years. And it devastated the island, but also it devastated our research facility. So, so this is uh, the station we have at the, at the coast, you know, the one that I showed you before. Mm -hmm. This is how the station looked after uh, Hurricane Maria. And this is the station in the forest, how it looked before and, and after the devastation. So you can imagine that it was really a difficult time. You know, this is actually uh, something that when I talk to students, I really like to, to tell them because um, this is when, Things like this happen in life. You, you, they strike you. You know, you you have to to think. You know, so now, like I was thinking, now what? You know, I mean, I've been raising this for fifteen years, and it's been destroyed in 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 seconds. You know, in minutes, in hours. You know, so what do I do now? You know, shall I change? You know, my job, or yeah. or, or or I start all over again? And you know what? I decided. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it again. You know, let's start all over again because with the experience that I have and the mm -hmm. help of the collaborators that I have, we should be able to be something better and stronger. And uh, that's precisely what we did. You know, this is the way the stations are right now. We have uh, uh, two trailers there, and actually one of them uh, was uh, from a DOE arm, so the, the Department of Energy and the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program. 
uh, we wrote uh, I wrote a couple of proposals to to get funding to to reconstruct and uh, one of the proposals was uh, this one and uh, you can see that uh, we are doing a lot of measurements there the station is running 24 7 again and uh, I have to say that honestly we are much better than what we were before and uh, the same thing with um, this other station at the cloud forest uh, unfortunately we have a power issue at the station still but the station is uh, more robust and with much more capabilities than the ones that we used to have so uh, like that saying you know that we have heard so many times when they're going get tough the tough get going you know <laughs> so if we fall we 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 get we have to get back up you know for yeah. sure so I actually like I, I was going to ask about the the you know the rebuilding of the structures because they they look quite impressive and 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 as you said some looks uh, the the equipment is better than it was before right so you are able to collect more precise and and and, and you know better data so do you, I, I do you have students out that are state how is that the data gets do you have people that goes to those stations to maintain them or that's something that uh, how often do that happen? Yeah, uh, yeah, you have to, you need to have someone going at least, at least every week, you know, once a week. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the good thing is that it's pretty close to 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 the campus of the university. It's uh, less than an hour drive uh, to to each station, you know. So if you're going to see us to to the coastal station or to the cloud forest station, to both of them, it's it's only it's less than an hour drive. And uh, you have to keep the instruments running. So, mm -hmm. uh, so because we are doing research projects, but also we are providing data to other people, you know, so to other groups, you know, with the World Meteorological Organization, with NOAA, so with NASA. So people are counting on those data. So it's important to keep the instruments running. And uh, when an instrument is it's down, then you have to, if uh, you went on Monday, but the instrument went down on Tuesday, then you have to go back again, probably Wednesday, you know, to try to fix that instrument. So, so there are, inst there are students, um, undergraduate students and graduate mm -hmm. students, and there is also an instrument specialist in charge of, of, of this, you know, and the students get involved with, with the projects and with the instruments as well. Mm -hmm. Except so it's because you know do have the, the, the there was a rebuilding of these stations. Um, you are, I'm assuming you're still you know keeping the focus of collecting the information that we're con that you were collecting before Maria. But any upgrades or any other type of information that the stations now are collecting that is coming either because of the upgrade and the you know the changes in climate and so forth that allows you to collect a different set of information and to have you know and then gather information gather a different perspective of the of the of the, of the different aerosols and climate oh yeah uh, yeah so that is important mm -hmm. there are there are, i mean we we managed uh, we have and uh, this is uh, what you're seeing here is a it's a very good example you know uh, uh one of the proposals that i wrote at that time was uh a, a proposal for NSF. Uh, they have a program that is called Major Research Instrumentation. And this is a program that, that funds ideas of, uh, for example, development of, uh, of new instrumentation. So we propose to do the aerosol and cloud analysis system. And this is this trailer that you see here, number one, is precisely that. It's a, it's a trailer that is going to be dedicated to the study to the study of aerosol and cloud interaction and it has seven different sensors that we did not have before that they will all be connected to an inlet that will be able to sample cloud and aerosols and we will be able to get a better understanding of the composition and interactions of these cloud and aerosol particles, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's a good example of how, and that, you know, that proposal was uh, just $1.4 million, you know, to be mm -hmm. able to build this, you know. So we have a postdoc uh, who is working actively in this project. 
Very nice, very nice. Yes, to the audience, you're welcome to uh, answer, uh, put any questions on the Q and A uh, chat, you know, icon, and uh, we will be glad to 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 answer them. Um, so, I, I, what are the things that you know you you mentioned as well? Was that I know that you were a, a professor at the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, and what kind of is is um, what kind of research did you do there? Is this, was this, uh, you know, I know it was related to 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 the ACAR project. In any other uh, aspect of the research that you were doing that was very specific uh, to the University of Puerto Rico and your research there? Yeah. So one of the things that uh, a very we had different projects and some of them were related to air quality. Uh, some of them we actually got the idea and wrote the proposal and got the funding for that and some of them were opportunities that they emerged you know life mm -hmm. was what happened with hurricane maria so yes. i want to tell you a little bit about this project uh, this is a project that um that was one of those you know uh, this is at the island before maria this was july 2017 and this is an image of a satellite showing the island at nighttime. So you see the lights, you know, of the island. And of course, this is San Juan where the capital is. So you see all these, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, this is where the metropolitan area is. And also Ponce, you know, so the bigger cities, you know, you see them really illuminated. This is just five days after Hurricane Maria. So we had basically, uh, the island was in darkness, you know, because uh, mm -hmm all the electrical grid was down. So maybe the lights that you see there were generators or, you know. So this is an interesting story, uh, story because I was uh, like a couple of days after the hurricane, I was just running, you know. Uh, there was no power, not much that we could do, you know. The island was paralyzed and I, I went for a jog. And I, I, when I was at the highest point of where I live, I look and I saw this haze layer, you know, and I was like, eh? I mean, how can that be? There is no one, almost no one working. There is no traffic. There is no one, uh, you know, producing pollution like what we usually do under normal circumstances. So where is that what coming is from? And uh, uh, we thought maybe it's the, Power, backup power generators that people are using just to be able to have some electricity everywhere, you know, in houses and wherever uh, there is some activity. So we wanted to actually study that and uh, we wanted to, to, to study it, but we didn't have any power in the university. Most of our instruments were uh, broken, we lost them. So an opportunity emerged with the Carnegie Mellon University and they sent us these low cost sensors that they are called RAMs and we could measure CO, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide and black carbon and among others. And uh, we were asking ourselves also once the electric grid start to be restored, what is mm -hmm. gonna happen? Is this going to decrease the pollution? It, is it, you know, how are we gonna be able to show that yeah. we're the backup power generators? So, and this is precisely what happened, you know. You can see here just an example with carbon monoxide in November, which is when we started the measurements and because was when we got the sensors. And we can see that as the electrical grid were, re, was restored, mm -hmm. the pollution started to decrease. So we were able actually to show that uh, with these low cost sensors that backup power generators have indeed degraded the air quality in the islands in the aftermath of the hurricane mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah that the concentrations decrease as power was restored so that, that, that was awesome a very, data yeah yeah good opportunity to to show this that's an awesome data because you said before you know we don't think about those power generators because they're so small right if you this is size and, and density right but they do make an impact if we it does still it just makes an impact in, into our our our, our environment mm -hmm. and the in the air that we breathe. Um, yeah. we are getting to the 430 and I would like to move further because I have some questions about your career path. Mm -hmm. But before we we move, I just want to I know that um, 
you have done a lot of work in Puerto Rico and when I, and I'm very excited in, 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 in aerosols and climate. And I want to ask you, um, what has been the major impact of your research in the Caribbean, um, you know, in the tropics area? What has been, what do you feel that is the greatest impact of your, of your research so, in the tropics and, and then, you know, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean? Yeah, so, so I think that one of the main things that, that our research activities uh, you know, have been able to produce is a better understanding of aerosol types and composition and sources that, affect, that are affecting the, <clears throat> the Caribbean region and other tropical regions. And also, I mean, what, it is, what is important about this, about knowing the type of the aerosol, the composition, the sources, is that actually that helps you to, to gain a better understanding of, of these uh, and the impacts of these on, for example, weather, climate, public health, cloud formation. You need that information about the, the composition uh, and the type of viruses to be able to understand this. You know? so, so for the tropics in general, you know that, but if we go to, to more specifics, you know, like, in Puerto Rico, for example, I think that what you're seeing here was a very good example of, of something that we learned, you know, this is not the first hurricane that we have, you know, we have had many, of course, no one like Maria in the last uh, 90 years, but uh, we learned that, that these generators are producing a lot of pollution, so you have to be careful in the use of them because mm -hmm. uh, uh, people can die actually out of uh, a poisoning with carbon monoxide, for example, you know, you can get intoxicated with this pollution. So, so it, that's one thing, that's one aspect. But the other, I think, beautiful aspect of this is how these low cost sensors, they help to, to fill in uh, the air quality data gaps that we were having because our air quality monitoring from the government uh, the network was down, was completely down. basically mm -hmm. destroyed, and these low cost sensors helped to gain some data uh, that, that we could use for that. Uh, so it shows that they could be deployed in other uh, extreme events or disasters, you know, uh, and mm -hmm. they will help in, in this regard. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one, you know, one of the things I think that another one interesting, we have done a lot of work with African dust, with Saharan dust, and uh, uh, that dust comes from Africa and arrives to the region. And, and we're talking about billions, you know, of tons of, of dust, you know. know. And uh, that dust, actually, people would think that, that well, it, it does affect visibility, you know, and uh, there are a couple of impacts that we will not have the time to talk about that today. But um, people will think that their properties will be very very different from the source because they have been traveling uh, over you know in the air in this saharan air layer for for days for seven yes. ten days and actually they travel in this layer that keeps them uh, quite similar to what was emitted at the source and this is also one of the interesting results that that we've been able to things that we've been able to learn uh, with our projects it's awesome. I think, you know, like you said, it's uh, learning, the, the, understanding the science and the chemistry of those particles. You may have understand better the, the impact that it has in our health. Also, the strong, you know, uh, storms are getting stronger. And so it also helps to inform our infrastructure and our places into how better um, manage those, those, those events. Um, Olga, this has been very interesting. We're going to pivot to the educational piece so we can give some time to our students but um, uh, so we have students watching today and um, did you always know you wanted to be a chemist? Say that again, sorry, I couldn't did, did you always did you always Did you always know that you wanted to be a chemist? Actually not, you know, <laughs> I, I, when I was in high school, uh, I remember I watched a movie, uh, The Deep uh, and, after I watched that movie, I thought that what I wanted to do with my life was to become a marine archaeologist. 
Okay, so I, I really wanted to pursue that until my first year in the university at college when I took biology and chemistry uh, in that first year, uh, I decided that I wanted to be a chemist, you know, so yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a question on the chat because um, now that you mentioned that you were, you were a chemist, it said, how does someone with a physics degree play a role in, in research that you do. I have, I have always been interested in atmospheric science, but thought that you needed an atmospheric science degree to do the work that you do. Actually, you know what, that um, there are a lot of people that comes from physics in our field and uh, uh, many people, you know, that, that their bachelor or master or PhD was in physics and then they follow up on on you know careers in in atmospheric science, it could be also that you do your bachelor degree in physics and then you know go uh, to to do something in atmospheric science. But your the background in physics helps a lot to understand many of the aspects that we deal when we are talking about atmospheric physics. You know, yes. uh, there's a lot uh, of that. You know, so it's not it, it is possible. You know, it is possible and and. And, and so it shows you that, you know, you don't have to follow any this, the various path to that, to, to that process, to that job. Um, yeah. so, I mean, you, so you, you see myself, you know, I, my degree was in chemistry, you know, and I got involved in this and, and, and you, you know, actually my bachelor degree was in chemistry, my master was in chemistry and my PhD was in chemistry. So I did not actually have um, a studies in atmospheric science, but my postdoc experience, which was oh. for three years, you know, it was in pure, you know, atmospheric science, working with atmospheric aerosols, and I could use all that knowledge in chemistry uh, applied to what I was doing in my postdoc. So, and then, you know, you, you actually become sort of like, you know, very proficient in, you know, like an expert in the area because you were working so much with that, you know, so. So you can you can be also having a background in physics, you know, and, and, and follow up on this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one thing that um, the second question that I'm going to ask now is uh, it's related to before I forget. Um, it's not related to career path, but it says in times of emergency, since generators are producing pollution at a haste, what are some possible alternatives that will keep people safe? when the power is out. Yeah, well, I think that um, it, it's not that we are not going to use the generators, you know, it's just that we need to be, you, we need to know how to, how to use them, you know. Uh, for example, in Puerto Rico, we knew of cases of people that they put them in the backyard, you know, uh, but in, uh, they put the exhaust to the house the, of the neighbor, you know, so because they didn't want to get the exhaust, you know, but the exhaust fumes, you know, but you cannot do that. So you, what can you do? Maybe you have to extend, you know, the exhaust in such a way that you don't get that air uh, stagnating, you know, there in, in, and, and doesn't uh, affect your family, but also other families, you know, it, the same with industries, you know, whoever is, is um, uh, using the backup generators, we have to uh, know that they produce a lot of uh, pollution that is harmful for human beings and that we need to somehow try to minimize that. So that is if we go for diesel and gasoline generators, which are the most common and the more affordable, you know, but you can, you also have other options. Of course, you know, you could use, uh, you could move from uh, your house, try right, to have solar panels, you know, that you depend less on, on fuel mm -hmm. combustion, you know, and uh, other, you know, alternatives, you know. So in Puerto Rico, there, there was, and I hope uh, still, you know, we keep moving in that direction. A, a lot of people that they got conscious because we were for months. Uh, I, I did not talk, uh, you know, about this in detail, but we were for months, you know. I know people that uh, Maria, Hurricane Maria was in September, and I, I know people in Yabucoa, which was the area where the hurricane came in, that they were without power until May, you know, almost a year, mm -hmm. you know. So 
uh, when when that happens, you know, you have to rethink how are you going to do things. Uh, and uh, uh, many people, you know, put solar panels in their houses and uh, other alternatives that, uh, as I said, uh, will reduce our dependency on fossil fuel. Awesome. Thank you, Olga. And I'm just going to give it back to the career panel. just didn't want to miss that question. Um, there's a question on the chat. How long did it take you to obtain your degree? So, yeah, so bachelor degree is usually four to five uh, years, you know, and uh, master is like two years. And it, it, this was my case, you know, and then the, the PhD is usually mm, between five and it, it depends on if you have done a master or not, you know. So I know like uh, in Puerto Rico is an average of like six years, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I spent five years, but it was because I have already done my, my master, you know, so it was less time. It also depends on, on factors such as your research projects and the instrumentation that, you, that you're using, but that's an average, you know, so we're talking about five, six, seven, uh, like 11 years, if you want to do a PhD, 10, oh. 11 years, you yeah. know, so. And that's without the postdoc, the, the, the training after that too. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you participated in the Department of Energy visiting faculty program. How was that experience? Um, did that play a role in coming here to BNL? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, when I was uh, a, probably I should stop sharing my screen so that we can uh, perform. Yeah, so when I was, um, did I stop sharing? Yes, yeah. you did. Okay, okay. So uh, I, I came here in the summers of 2016, 17, and 18. And uh, I came with three students every year, uh, one graduate student and two undergrad students. And uh, we were working with mainly with two people here. We interacted with many others, but uh, mm -hmm. with Art Sedlasek and yes. uh, Ernie Lewis. They are from the Department of Environmental Science, the department in which I'm working right now. So, and they were, um, we were working with data from a, a project in the Amazon basin. It was a project called Go Amazon. So it was a great experience, you know, I get to know the people here, the facilities here. And uh, I, when this opportunity, you know, arose, I, I said, okay, I mean, I know this place. I really would like to work with these people. I know the good science that they are doing. So that definitely had a very large influence in, in my decision. That's, that's great to hear. You were, how many, uh, you were here, a few, how many summers? Three. One summer? Three. Three summer. Three summer. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, awesome. Um, I know that because you have students, you mentor those students and you are a mentor to, to them. Um, how, how important the mentorship is, and I, you know, for our young uh, students in terms of, you know, finding a mentor and, and, and the value of a mentor, of a mentor in their lives, the impact that they make. Yeah, you know, uh, I think that uh, uh, that is very, very, very important. And, and uh, I had the opportunity in Puerto Rico to to mentor many students uh, at different levels and actually from a high school students, you know, that they come to do science fair projects, you know, yes. uh, to undergrads and, and, and graduate students. And it was a great opportunity because you have the opportunity to motivate them, uh, advise them, help them in their decision making. And, and some of them, they might end up actually studying or working in one of these STEM related areas and field. I had the, the experience of an, an undergraduate student who started with me and he wanted to study nuclear science, nuclear, and he was, you know, fixed with that, but he came to work in my group. I was not doing any of, of that, you know, so. And um, after less than a year, he sat down with me and he said, you know what, I think that I'm gonna give you some news that you are gonna be happy about. And he said, I want to do my PhD in atmospheric science. You know, I want to study this. And I was very happy. He's doing his PhD at Purdue University right now. So 
you know, and uh, some of my students, you know, I have a student working at NASA, another one at the National Weather Service with NOAA, and I feel, you know, proud of them and happy that I could somehow contribute to their development, so. You, you spoke with a lot of pride, and I also say that it, it shows our students that you already know, know where you're going to end up. So taking advantage of experiences like this kind of informs you and, 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 you, and, and you know, inform your choices and decisions. We are at a 4, 4, uh, 445 mark. Time flies, Olga, when you're having fun. This has been wonderful. Before we go, what any, if nobody remembers anything that you said, what would be the last piece of advice that you want to give to our audience? Well, I will say, since we have so many students, I will definitely uh, advise students to, to get into summer internships, you know, because uh, that will make you aware of things that you maybe did not even know that you were good at those, or maybe that the other way around, since that you say, I definitely would not like to be doing that in life, you know, so, and uh, the other thing is that, you know, whenever you fall, you know, get back up, you know, because that's one thing that we learn, you know, and uh, yeah, that those will be my two advices. Very nice, very nice. So Olga, I think we will have to, sorry, uh, we will have to invite you back, maybe when you are not, you know, few months into being, maybe a year later, and talk more about the work that, that you will continue to do here at the lab. Um, it just felt like, we, we had a lot of good conversation in a time, it's just time. So thank you, Olga. Thank you so much for today. Uh, it, was, it was a pleasure. I really appreciate your, your time and sharing with us the wonderful research that goes on in Puerto Rico at the University of Puerto Rico and our facilities there. Um, muchas, muchas gracias. Uh, everybody, please tune in for the next Science Thursday, December 16th. Our guest will be Susan Pepper from the non Proliferation Department. Uh, we would like to thank Brookhaven National Lab for hosting uh, today's event and we encourage you to check out our programs, our research programs, our college internship, our high school programs, um, and the filter contact that we have on our, on our education website. Um, check us on social media and thank you everyone. Please stay safe, be well, and see you next time.